Welcome to Light of the World Gospel Outreach. And the subject we're discussing and investigating tonight is Celtic spirituality. Now by way of introduction I have to say the following and that is this, quite simply that this DVD is not made in order to ridicule people's faith or certain belief in a Celtic system of religion. But the Bible also tells us plainly that we are to discern or to test all things. Today there is a resurgence of Celtic spirituality. In the old Celtic religion there was a strong belief that contact could be made into the world of spirit or spirits via certain media such as lakes and rivers and streams and wells. So we see that this was a strong belief in another dimension or another realm. And water was believed to be the element through which one could contact the uh, spirit world or the spirit dimension. Now today there is a resurgence of what many people are claiming is Celtic Christianity. But on closer inspection of this, we have to ask the question, is what is being propounded today actually the same thing as the Celtic spirituality in the earlier days of Celtic Christianity? Undoubtedly some of it is, but are there added elements that are being put into this which are very similar to what is the pagan Celtic spiritual belief? And in actual fact, when we look at Celtic Christianity, we find that there are still many things that were taken over from the Celtic pagan religion into what is called Celtic Christianity. For example, we look at the symbol of the Triketera. And the symbol of the Triketera, people are saying today, and perhaps they did then, that this is a symbol of the Trinity. But in actual fact it predates the Christian usage of that symbol. And then we have other things, like the Celtic High Cross. And of course, if we go back into the very basics of the Bible, and we realise that the whole uh, thing has a Jewish understanding when we go back to the fact that our Messiah, Yeshua, or we would say Jesus is the Latinized form, but we realise when we go back and we look back, then he would not have uh, told us to have such things as crosses and other symbolical things. And so when we look back we see that there is a, a what people are claiming is a Celtic spirituality, an inheritance in these things, that we should embrace these things today. And so we see that there is an attempt to revive Celtic um, Christianity today and this does seem to include a belief in such things as holy wells and holy places and things like that. And so we see that these things are taking place. Now, today of course, in the, in the realm of Wicca and witchcraft, we see that they, they have the use of the Triketera. And of course they're claiming, and I believe it's possibly true, that this comes back from the pagan uh, system predating Christianity. And so, all these things that are being brought in, are they really biblical or are they 
uh, harking back to the days of pagan Celtic spiritual belief. Now, we have to speak the truth in love and we have to realise or when we're dealing with these things, that there are people today who are claiming to set up centres. There's one called Sanux on the Isle of Arran. And when you read through their website and you go down and you look down on their homepage and the introductory to this, you'll find that these people are not only claiming a Celtic spirituality but also are encouraging people to study the desert fathers and the desert mothers and such things as what they are saying is the Celtic way of meditation that is uh, the picture of the road, uh, the picture of the cave and so forth. But when we look at Eastern mysticism, we see that in Tibet, for example, certain of the mystics and certain of the sadhus of India and so forth, traveling in orange robes and all these kind of things, and we see that in Tibet itself, uh, we discover that people would lock themselves away in caves. They were called ascetics. So now this uh, business of Celtic fathers, or should I say desert fathers and desert mothers, and we're being asked to read material by these people and we're being encouraged by uh, their saying, oh yes, these were really spiritual people. And then we have another centre in Wales. I believe it's in Pembrokeshire in Wales. And they're saying exactly the same thing, not only on their website, but in their books. Now, the Bible tells us that we should have no graven image in the likeness of male or female, or even any kind of symbolical representation of the Godhead. Because the Godhead is not something that we can discern by symbolism. It was Ignatius of Loyola who claimed to have a vision that he saw a musical instrument with three strings and this brought such a tremendous revelation concerning the Holy Trinity that he cried for a whole day and wept over this vision. Now as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are we to embrace all these things? And the people in Wales who are in this uh, Celtic Christian centre they put what they call a high cross on a certain hill. And they are claiming that many people have come to this great big wooden cross and people have embraced this cross physically and received uh, physical healings. And they are nailing pieces of paper with prayer requests onto this wooden cross. They're calling it a high cross. And they're saying, oh, even the witches are saying that they, they cannot come against this power that is emanating from this high wooden cross. But surely the power should be coming from the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, who is at the right hand of God. And these people are telling us yesterday the desert fathers and the desert mothers. Well, you can easily study that. You can easily go to the Encyclopedia Britannica or any other reputable historical documentation to discover the beginnings of these desert fathers and mothers. And one of them was called Anthony, who has been referred to as Saint Anthony. And this man locked himself away in the desert, in a cave, and he starved himself to death and he didn't wash and he didn't drink and in all probability he was having hallucinations and he saw lots of demons and they were pulling at the flesh of his body and things like this. We're being encouraged to read this kind of literature by these people. And in one of the centres, I believe again it's, it's on the island of Aaron, they are going to build 
a series of buildings where people can come and stay and they're going to have a healing garden and in this healing garden they're building the garden in the shape of this pagan triketera and then they're going to place outside of a beehive shaped chapel a Celtic high cross and next to that Celtic high cross they're, they're going to have a pool of water Now, if this is not paganism gone mad, I don't know what is. But, however, so if we study all these things, we will see that these things have an origin in paganism. And nothing to do with the plain and simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, some people might say, well, is this a kind of conspiracy from uh, the Roman Catholic religion to bring people back into all this mystical stuff that was accepted by the Catholic Church years and years ago. I don't know. Maybe it is. But what we must understand is that the Lord is wanting us to move away from such things and back to the simplicity of what is written in the four Gospels and in the Book of Romans and the writings of Paul. Now. A lot of this spirituality came into Egypt through the Brahmins. And the Brahmins brought a Hindu faith, Hindu teachings like the transmigration of souls, they brought it into Alexandria in Egypt at the same time as I believe was Pantanus or Pantanius, and then we have Oregon of Alexandria. And Oregon of Alexandria imbibed these teachings of the Brahmins or some people would refer to them as gymnosophists and so they were sophisticated philosophical people bringing pantheism, Hinduism into Egypt and of course Egypt had a religion of its own and in the school of Alexandria, the philosophy of Alexandria school in the third century we see that 2nd century, 3rd century, began this strange mixture of the pagan into the so-called Christian faith. And there's a christianizing of Far Eastern type ideas. And so we see this influenced people as Antony of Egypt. And so the idea of having hermits and things like this predates Christianity, as does the idea of monasticism. So there's a term going around these days, and it's called New Monasticism. Well, there's nothing new about it, because there were the Vestal Virgins, who you could call them uh, nuns, uh, who guarded the sacred flame, who lived separate from everybody else, these Vestal Virgins. And then there was other... Uh, kind of communities predating Christianity in Egypt where people lived together in these communities. And so we see also with the Buddhist monks and all these things that predate Christianity and so these things were taken on board by people who maybe had some kind of Christian experience but who began to mix them all into this melting pot and so we get this string. In Ireland also there was the Bridgets, there were three goddesses and that developed later on into St. Bridget and so we see that there are also uh, times and seasons on the Celtic pagan calendar which are brought up again, uh, resurging in these new communities, these Celtic communities where they're advocating a form of monasticism even the beehive shape is very interesting because uh, the Masons have uh, a beehive as part of their uh, symbolism. And so we see there is these pagan connections are going on with these things. So these people are asking us to embrace what would be 
deviations from the true simplicity of the gospel. Paul talks about being, he says that the, I'm afraid that the serpent has beguiled you and, and tempted you to wait at the Corinthians. And of course, when he's writing the letter to the Colossians, Paul is talking about um, people who have these philosophies and touch not, taste not, handle not, which is will worship and neglecting of the body and stuff like this, which is what these desert fathers and mothers did. And so we see that this was an old belief, not something that was in Christianity. People that wanted to cut themselves off because there was this idea that matter was evil. And we had to live life of spirit. And therefore, what you do is you starve the body. You kind of flagellate the body. You lock yourself away in a cave. You don't eat. You don't do anything. You don't wash. Uh, you just uh, supposedly um, deny the body any of its normal functions and try to live spirit. Well, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ talks about salvation being spirit, soul and body. And our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so it's not the neglecting of the body and all this voluntary humility and the worship of angels or trying to live like angels. And uh, men were made to be men and not made to be angels. In other words, uh, trying to be, or to be eunuchs or uh, celibates, uh, all living together in a community. And most of these communities started off with good intentions, but because you're denying human nature the basic rights of, uh, of the human body, then the body would rebel, and, and, and so there would be this terrible um, nemesis, retribution getting back. And so they, people would have awful struggles uh, with their sexual lives and so forth, until we find that the awful things by the time of the Middle Ages. Terrible laziness had crept into these monasteries. Uh, tunnels between a monastery and a nunnery and a convent where the, you know, the, 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 the monks and the priests could go and have sex with the nuns and stuff like this. All this has been documented. And of course it's all because of what was done to the human body and to the normal, everyday way of living that God has said in his word. You know, the marriage bed is honourable, etc, etc. So we see all these things taking place. We see, even on the uh, New King James Version of the Bible, you have the triketera. And... Um, we also see that in witchcraft the triketer is used, it's got the power of power of three. Here we have it, somebody has it engraved upon their arm. Three powers in one, and so forth. So, we see this, and then we have this business of contemplative prayer. Now, this actually began... Um, in the second and third century with a certain hermit and he devised a means of meditation and <laughs> this is humorous but at the same time it's absolutely, it's absolutely true you can check these things out and that this particular hermit devised a system of meditation whereby he actually gazed on the naked navel of his stomach so where people say oh stop that navel gazing it has actually uh, a real connotation. It actually did happen. And um, this hermit devised a means of meditation and that include, included gazing at the navel of the stomach. And others used breathing techniques, the use of mantras, you know, repeating the name of God or the name of Jesus over and over again, breathing out uh, these things. And we know the Lord never taught uh, any of these things at all. And so now we have, you know, all this emphasis on holy places, holy wells, special water, special areas, you know, where the peace of God is, <gasps> holy church buildings and all this sort of thing. 
And all this is supposed to be Celtic Christianity. How much of it is, I don't know. But I do know that there were pagan things that were brought over. So the use of all these crosses, for example. And so the symbol of the cross predates uh, the coming of the Messiah even. In Egypt, you had the Ark Cross. And then the Romans had the Tau cross, and that was for the god Tau. And I believe it was Constantine who, uh, again in the 3rd century, also allowed the pagans, he baptized them in mass, sprinkling them with holy water, and they all came into the church, so-called, and they had still had their... Uh, Tau crosses hanging around them with all their paganism. Because Constantine probably didn't even ever really get converted and he wasn't baptized till after he was dead. And he was still the Pontifex Maximus as far as we know of the pagan religions. So the question is, what are these people doing setting up these centers? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Are we being tempted by the enemy to go back to these pagan ways, which have got nothing to do with the pure, simple faith of the followers of Yeshua, the Son of the Living God? And the scripture says, do not follow the ways of the heathen in Jeremiah chapter 10. And we know that. There's lots of pagan things, whether you think of Christmas or Easter or Ishtar. But now to take the people back to all this and candles and meditating and thinking that you're sitting in a cave and all the rest of it. And so you see, caves have everything to do with mystery, mystery religion. Mithras was supposed to be born in a cave, and various gods were, came out of the earth and out of the ground and were born in caves. And of course at the Delphi Oracle and other places, the priestesses would sit in a cave and they were breathing the fumes from underground, those hallucinogenic fumes, and they would breathe them in and then they would sort of start waffling on. And people took it as being prophecy. Jesus was never born in a cave. You'll understand that if you study the fact of a caravana seri, uh, you know, and where the people, when they were doing the taxing in the days of, uh, you know, the Caesar, and they were having, oh, Augustus Caesar was it, and they had to be taxed, they would set up a temporary site made out of wood with stalls for the animals and all that sort of thing. And that's what it was. So all this business about caves and everything else. And so we see that. And um, so if you look then, you can just look at, at um, Celtic religion. Uh, and you will discover that all these things that are used in so-called Celtic uh, Christianity, and especially today, they were all there in the pagan elements predating Christianity. So, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So what kind of a spirit is it that causes miracles through people hugging a giant wooden cross. It may be that some people are getting genuinely healed, but I believe that there is a psychic element involved in this. Just the same as Asclepius, the serpent god of healing. He would come to people in dreams, and people would sleep in a cave. <laughs> Is it not the same thing? So that they would get a dream and then in that dream they would be told the remedy for, uh, you know, the cure or the remedy for their illness. And that's real, that happened. It happened in the Roman Empire. It happened at those times that people, you know, believed in this uh, serpent god Asclepius of healing and would seek to have a dream uh, and get a revelation. And so... You know, there is a parallel. In the book of Joel it says that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions. 
and your old men will dream dreams. But that's from the Spirit of God. It's not from going into a cave and seeking all these things in these ascetic manners. And so the Apostle Paul, you read it. If we read that, chapter 1, chapter 2 of Colossians, you will see there's nothing there that we have to go into a cave and we have to do this and we have to do this voluntary humility business. And so all these things have come from Celtic paganism. And there's many other things besides when we begin to look into this in more detail. For this first session we'll close with this. And remember that Jesus Christ said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.